this is Off the Cuff, and I'm Steve from TorahFamily.org. Quite often, I get people asking me about my current understanding of the end times and how things could play out. So, I put together this PDF that shows the perspective of the birth pain starting in the winter. Today, we'll be reviewing this timeline. In all of my end-time teachings, I try to look at patterns and cycles. So, while we should always be watching and praying, I do my best to see what history is telling us about the future. We know Isaiah 46.10 says he makes known the end from the beginning and from ancient times what is still to come. Plus, Ecclesiastes says what has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. So, if we want to know the future, we should study the past and consider all the possibilities we need to be open to. That's why I do my best to show all the plausible scenarios as I can in my teachings. And, as always, this teaching will be no different. What I'm going to present here, I actually just presented at the Raising Up the Remnant conference. But, I went through it so fast that I believe it would be beneficial to slow it down some so we can process it a little better. However, we will still be moving rather fast. Now, I'm not going to read everything on this PDF, mainly just going over it as a whole. You can download it from the teaching page on our site directly under the teaching. We should always be watching and praying. These are simply thoughts to consider and how things may happen as we all continue to watch and pray. Even if you disagree with something here or there, at the very least, consider how these thoughts could apply with your own personal understanding for future possibilities. As a whole, what I'm about to present here can apply to any year. However, I want to have some fun and point out some things that may apply specifically to the season we're in right now at the time of this recording on the Hebrew calendar. But again, we need to focus on cycles and patterns more than anything. Now, many quote Matthew 24, verse 7, which says, Nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. Please note that I have the word in crossed out. That's because it's not there in the Greek. The Greek for various places is kata to pos. Kata is a preposition. It means according to. To pos means passages. So, Yeshua is referring to what has been written in the prophets. Now, I believe something we need to consider here is that the verse could be referring to events that happen all at the same time, that being the birth pains that are noted in the next verse. I also believe it's possible that the nations mentioned here are those of Jacob and Esau. The kingdoms are those of the kingdom of light and darkness, and the famines will be the result of the earthquake which is mentioned in Isaiah 24. If you struggle with the one-year perspective of the tribulation, please see our teaching, the one-year tribulation, and the return of Yeshua for more on that. I personally believe every follower of Yeshua needs to see that teaching. Think of it this way. How long would it take to go through the cities of Israel when persecuted? Six months or three and a half years? Matthew 10, 23. When you are persecuted in one place, flee to another. I tell you the truth, you will not finish going through the cities of Israel before the Son of Man comes. Six months is one-seventh of the given punishment of 42 months. Consider these verses in Leviticus 26, verse 18, 21, and 23. These verses show how Yahweh will multiply our afflictions by seven if we remain stiff-necked in our sins. But if Yahweh has decreed the maximum penalty at the start, can't he cut it short one-seventh out of his mercy just the same? (laughs) Thus, six months and not 42 months, one-seventh of the time. Now, some might say, well, how can you say six months here, but you're saying it will be one year? 
Well, good question. The birth pains come first, but the birth pains are not the tribulation. The tribulation is under the Antichrist, and it'll start sometime around Passover, most likely after the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So, after Unleavened Bread, he will be given authority to make war against the saints. His authority will end at the last day of Sukkot. So, from Unleavened Bread to Sukkot, six months. But where does the one year come in at, right? Well, as we will cover here shortly, everyone will be in the land for second Passover seven months after Sukkot. So, just as Noah was in the ark for just over one year, from the time the Antichrist begins his war on the saints to the time we are all in the land under Yeshua's rule at second Passover, it will also be just over one year. We'll cover more on this later in the teaching. Now, there will always be something to watch in trying to understand prophecy, especially when trying to understand the 70 years that's mentioned in several places. While the common thought was it could be that of the 70th anniversary from 1948, there are still other perspectives to keep in mind. One of those being how Israel just completed 70 years of governing from Jerusalem. They started governing from Jerusalem on December 26th in 1949. The thing is, Israel has never made Torah the law of the land. So, we have Yahweh's people living in Yahweh's land, not following Yahweh's law. Biblical history shows that's always been a recipe for disaster. And December 26th of 2019 was the 70th anniversary of them ruling from Jerusalem, but not under the Torah. Why is that significant? Zechariah chapter 1, verse 12. Then the angel of Yahweh said, Yahweh Almighty, how long will you withhold mercy from Jerusalem and from the towns of Judah, which you have been angry with these 70 years? However, the English here is off. It should actually read, Then the angel of Yahweh said, Yahweh Almighty, how long until you withhold mercy from Jerusalem and from the towns of Judah? which you have been angry with these 70 years. That's a big difference. You see, he's already been giving them mercy these 70 years, giving them mercy because they haven't made Torah the law of the land. So, it could be that judgment is at the door. Now, before we begin looking at any kind of possible sequence of how things could play out, I believe there's a key verse many overlook in prophecy, that being Zechariah 3.8. Listen, O high priest Joshua, and your associates seated before you, who are men symbolic of things to come. I am going to bring my servant, the branch. As noted earlier, history is cyclical. As noted here, these men are symbolic of things to come. That all being said, this verse could be important to the time we're living in today. Why? Consider Zechariah 1.1. In the eighth month of the second year of Darius, the word of Yahweh came to the prophet Zechariah, son of Berechiah, the son of Edo. Now, why is this important? Well, first please note that the Hebrew word for of can also mean with just the same. So, it could be in the eighth month and second year of Darius. Why is that important? Well, this is an element that will pertain only to the year we are in right now. If history repeats and those in that time were symbolic of things to come, do we have anything of that similarity today to consider? Well, possibly. <laughs> I'm not one to get political. However, we can see that the current president of the United States is in his third year at the time of this recording. 
both Zechariah and Haggai are written at the time that Darius was in his third year. It's mentioned as in the months with the second year. Is this something to be mindful of? Now, I'm not exactly sure, but it is interesting, especially when we know that biblical history is cyclical. Now, since we noted that both Haggai and Zechariah were written in the same time frame, let's consider some verses from both of these men. Haggai 1.1 shows us it's the sixth month of the same timing as Zechariah. Then we see verse 5 say, Give careful thought to your ways. Again, that was the sixth month. Haggai 2.1 and 6 and 7 shows judgment is declared on the 21st day of the seventh month of that same time frame. It says, In a little while I'll once more shake the heavens and the earth. In Zechariah 1, verses 1 through 3, Yahweh declares his anger and calls for repentance in the eighth month. In verse 3, he said, Return to me, declares Yahweh Almighty, and I will return to you. Then we see judgment is decreed on the 24th day of the ninth month. Now that's one day before Hanukkah. So up to this point, judgment has been delayed. And here we see judgment is coming. However, at the time of Revelation 10, verses 5 through 7, we see there is no more delay. So the next event we are to be looking for is the resurrection when Yeshua takes his bride to Mount Sinai for the wedding. Luke 21, 36 says, Be always on the watch and pray that you may be able to escape all that is about to happen and that you may be able to stand before the Son of Man. Stand before the Son of Man. This is marriage language. It's the time when Yeshua receives his bride. Revelation 18.4 Then I heard another voice from heaven say, Come out of her, my people, so that you will not share in her sins, so that you will not receive any of her plagues. This is the resurrection, when he calls his bride out. Then we see Babylon destroyed in Revelation 18.10. Then we immediately see the wedding in 19.7. So he delivers his people out before the judgment. Thus, we are to pray we escape all things as noted in Luke 21.36. This takes place at the time of the earthquake as given in Isaiah 24. This earthquake will be the beginning of the birth pains as noted in Matthew 24, verses 7 and 8. But please notice Isaiah 26 and 66. Isaiah 26 discusses the earth giving birth to her dead. Isaiah 66 says that the birth happens before the birth pains. Now let me say that again. Isaiah 66 says the birth happens before the birth pains. In fact, I would submit that the earthquake takes place because of the resurrection. Think of it this way. Ever try to take a band-aid off slow? It's painful. (laughs) But then your mom comes along and rips it right off. But before you yell in pain, well, the band-aid is already off. You see, it takes milliseconds for the pain signals to travel through your nervous system to your brain. Then it takes milliseconds for your response to fully kick in. Likewise with the earth giving birth to her dead, the resurrection. It will happen milliseconds before the earthquake, but will most likely be the root cause of the earthquake. Once the resurrection takes place, those birth pains kick in. Now, This also explains how people will be missing via the resurrection. However, no one will notice because all of the world, I'm talking worldwide chaos, is going on everywhere. So no one will notice it because of that chaos taking place everywhere. But the question for everyone is, when will this event happen? 
with the first delay noted just before the last day of Sukkot. Could the delay be pushed to the last day of Hanukkah, that being the second Sukkot? Should we be considering the last day of Hanukkah? Well, possibly. It is interesting how the parable of the ten virgins is about the oil as well. Now, another day to consider is the tenth day of the tenth month. Jeremiah 52 verse 4 shows it's the time Babylon marched against Jerusalem with their whole army. Now, why is that of importance? Well, Revelation 19 shows the destruction of Babylon to be a time of rejoicing. Now, why is that of significance? Well, consider Zechariah 8.19. This is what Yahweh Almighty says, the fasts of the fourth, fifth, seventh, and tenth months will become joyful and glad occasions and happy festivals, Moedim, for Judah. Therefore, love truth and peace. So the tenth day of the tenth month, that being the anniversary when Babylon surrounded Jerusalem, could be when the tables are turned. It will be the beginning of woes for Babylon this time around. I also believe the Ark of the Covenant and the Tent of Meeting come out in this earthquake. See my teachings, the return of the tent, and the image of the beast. For what it's worth, besides the tenth day of the tenth month, the last day of Hanukkah will always fall on one of the first days of the tenth month. So, it seems the tenth month is something to consider for the return of Yeshua. Now, whether the tenth month proves to be significant is yet to be seen. History does seem to make it noteworthy, though. But whenever Yeshua returns for his bride, it appears to be before the 24th day of the 11th month. Why? Well, because it appears Yeshua is standing with his bride on the 24th day of the 11th month. Zechariah 1.7 gives us the timing of it being the 11th month of the same time frame as spoken earlier. Verse 8 says, He was standing among the myrtle trees in a ravine. Myrtle trees. Esther's name in Hebrew means myrtle tree. She was the bride to the king. Is this a typology we should be considering? Well, possibly. Verse 11 shows the whole world at rest and in peace, meaning the dust has settled from the earthquake. Now, verse 12 shows judgment will now begin for Judah. This is a verse we read earlier regarding the judgment coming after the 70 years. This sets up for Jerusalem being surrounded, as Yeshua mentioned in Luke 21, verse 20. This will most likely be at the time of Purim in the 12th month. This will be when the Assyrian invades and those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Please see my teachings, The Assyrian and Satan's Greatest Masquerade, Part 1 and 2. Though Israel is beaten down, near defeat, they conquer the Assyrian under the leadership of the Anti-Messiah. As I mentioned, I truly believe the ark and the tent will be revealed at the time of the earthquake. This will enable Israel to get the sacrificial system going in full swing again. So, when the Assyrian invades and brings the sacrifices to a stop, everyone will believe he is the Antichrist. I also cover this in the two-part teaching, Satan's Greatest Masquerade. It shows how the real Antichrist will defeat the fake Antichrist. <laughs> you see, so many people will believe the Assyrian is the Antichrist because he brings those sacrifices that were set up with the ark and the tent to an end. Then, when he gets defeated by the real Antichrist, everyone will think the real Antichrist is the Messiah. Remember, Yeshua said it will be a time of deception, that even the very elect would be deceived if that were possible. So, even though Israel is beaten down near defeat, they conquered the Assyrian under the leadership 
of the Antichrist. I believe this is where radical Islam is defeated. This paves the way for the Antichrist to be heralded as the Prince of Peace for defeating Islam. The Antichrist then sets the tent and the ark back up for Passover. There will not be a third temple for the tribulation. It will be the tent that gets set up. Plus, the ark will be the image of the beast. Again, please see our teachings, the return of the tent and the image of the beast. This leads us to Passover. This will be when the anti-Messiah pursues believers who hold to Yeshua and the commands of Yahweh. This most likely takes place around Passover or the end of unleavened bread. I currently lean to the end of unleavened bread. Though I don't have time to go into it in this teaching, there's reason to believe that the Antichrist will try to force all non-Jews to follow the Noahide laws and forbid them, yes, forbid them to pursue the Torah. Thus, he pursues everyone who tries to pursue the Torah. This is very similar to how believers were forbidden to pursue the Torah throughout church history in the Catholic Church. In this next item now, we have two different theories. It's when the abyss is opened in the fifth trumpet. The locust army is released for five months. Now, the time of the locusts in Revelation 9 verses 1 through 11 is similar to the time the waters covered the earth in the flood. The flood happened around the time of second Passover. So, there is biblical thought for it to happen at second Passover here with the locusts as well. Now, regarding these locusts, they're released for judgment. When we consider 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4, it says, For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but sent them to hell, putting them into gloomy dungeons to be held for judgment. I know many people think this is for their judgment, but I think as a whole, we need to realize the possibility that this is actually holding them for the time of judgment that they will be doing on the earth, meaning they will be the tool that Yahweh brings the judgment in. The question is, does this happen at the time of the earthquake in the 10th month of the Hebrew calendar, thus making them be defeated by the Antichrist at the time of Shavuot in the third month? And please remember, the last day of Hanukkah falls within the first few days of the 10th month. So, the last day of Hanukkah and the 10th day of the 10th month is applicable in this for whatever year it could happen. In one perspective of this timing, the birth pains could take place on the last day of Hanukkah, and then the marriage takes place on the 10th day of the 10th month, making both days fall on significant timing. That being judgment on the last day of Hanukkah, the second Sukkot, and the wedding taking place on the first fast day that is turned into a feast. If it happens at this time frame, this would make the Antichrist look all the more like the Savior at the time of Shavuot, solidifying his deception in the eyes of the public. Again, the other theory is that they are released on second Passover as in the days of the flood. Then Yeshua defeats them at Armageddon in the seventh month. I currently lean to this timing of them being released around second Passover. The next major time to watch would be the time of Sukkot. It's possible the two witnesses begin calling down the bowl judgments on the first day of Sukkot. The first day brings the first bowl, painful sores. The second day brings the second bowl, that being the sea turned to blood, and the third bowl, rivers and springs turned to blood. So the second day is affecting all the waters of the earth. The third day then brings the fourth bowl, when the sun scorches everything with fire. The fourth day brings the fifth bowl, darkness. Then the two witnesses are killed by the end of that day. Then on the fifth, sixth, seventh, and half of the eighth day, the two witnesses lie dead in the streets in Jerusalem, but are raised on that eighth day. 
the last day of Sukkot will be the Battle of Armageddon, which I call Homo Ed. Yeshua's year with his bride at Mount Sinai is cut short and he defeats the Antichrist. Yeshua then saves the tents of Judah as noted in Zechariah 12.7. Then he heads to Jerusalem. This is all addressed in our teachings, Satan's Greatest Masquerade, Part 1 and 2. This will be the time of Ezekiel 38, when Yahweh brings Gog and Magog out with hooks. They are drawn out and join the Antimessiah at Mount Sinai to fight the last battle. This battle matches Revelation 16 and Joshua chapter 10. Then, the greatest earthquake ever with hailstones takes place in Revelation 16, verses 16 through 21. This matches that of Joshua's conquest in Joshua chapter 10. Also, it matches Ezekiel 38, verses 19 through 23. So, what happens after this? The second exodus. Survivors from the tribulation begin their journey home. Jeremiah 23, verses 3 through 8, and Jeremiah 16. The survivors are the believers who Yeshua cuts the tribulation short for, those who had to go through the time of purification, the remaining six churches of Revelation chapter 2 and 3. Plus, Isaiah 66, verses 19 and 20, discusses the exodus taking place after the tribulation. How will this happen? The survivors will walk through fire and water in this exodus. The survivors and what happens with them are covered in our teaching titled Armageddon and the Parousia. It will take seven months for these survivors to make their journey and seven months to clean the dead bodies from the land. It's the cleanup from Armageddon. But why seven months? What's the significance? Because seven months from Sukkot takes us to Second Passover. Second Passover is provided for those who have touched a dead body and for those who are on a long journey. Since it takes seven months to clean the bulk of the dead bodies from the land, First Passover won't be able to be observed because everyone will be unclean from touching the dead bodies. So those in the land will need the second Passover. And then there will be many survivors still traveling. So the provision for the second Passover in Numbers chapter 9 is seen in prophecy. At that time, all Israel is back in the land under Yeshua for the millennium. After the millennium, Satan is released for a short time. Satan deceives many and surrounds Jerusalem. But please note, there is no war. Fire then consumes the enemies. Then the second resurrection takes place. Then we see the judgment and eternity. The eternal eighth day, the new beginning. In conclusion, as noted in our teaching titled The One-Year Tribulation and the Return of Yeshua, we showed when Daniel 12.7 says it will be for a time, times, and half a time, that it actually says it will be for a moed, moedim, and chatzi. Chatzi simply meaning in the midst of. So, if this timeline perspective is to be considered, how does that verse apply here? Well, if you look at the sequence of events, it actually applies perfectly. We see we still have three moedim that are feasts within the timeline concluding in the midst of Sukkot. Again, this timeline is simply something to consider as we all learn and grow in our understanding. Here are some other teachings that may help with this. We also have many others on our page, the End of Day series. Well, that's all I have. Remember, for the most part, this is something that can be applied to any year. The biggest thing is to watch for biblical patterns and cycles. As always, think about it. Pray about it. But more than anything, be a doer of the word and not a hearer only. Until next time, Shalom.